Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Museum After Hours, our monthly lecture series. I'm Trey Johnson, and for this Valentine's Day presentation, we are joined by Marla Day in our second international broadcast in Museum After Hours history. Marla Day received her bachelor's and master's degrees in apparel and textiles from Kansas State University and is the curator of K-State's Historic Costume and Textile Museum in Manhattan. Day has curated a number of exhibits, including Mantles for Women, Rites of Passage, Nellie Dawn, Dresses that Worked for Women, and Woven Wonders, a cross-section of American history. Tonight, Day will be presenting Dress for Success, Nellie Dawn in American Fashion. Ellen Nell Quinlan Donnelly made quite a name for herself in the fashion industry of the 20th century. Better known as Nellie Dawn, this native Kansan built a fashion empire of affordable, stylish clothing for women of all ages and economic incomes. Not only was she well known for her fashions, Nellie Dawn's successful company treated employees fairly and human humanely at a time when the industry standards were far from that. Her story is one of innovation and hard work. We'll have some time after the pre presentation to answer a few questions, so be sure to use the chat and Q&A feature to pose those questions to our presenter. So let's all give a warm welcome to Marla Day. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, from, I'm in a little town near Dusseldorf, Germany, and so it's very late for me, and so uh, hopefully I will, uh, manage this all okay, but, uh, and hopefully there's no technical difficulties, but uh, so here we go. Thanks, Trey. Yeah, can you see that all right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, next. So if you ever want to reach out to the Costume and Textile Museum, uh, we're located in Justin Hall on the campus of Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas. Next. And so when you come to see me, this is where we are located on the third floor of Justin Hall. Next. This is our workroom because uh, people are always curious to see some behind the scenes. And so this is where everything comes in and we clean and process and document and photograph. Next. And then we have to store it someplace. So uh, next door to us is a climate controlled uh, room and everything is stored there, all 17,000 pieces. Plus, so there's a lot, a lot of closets to look at. Thank you, Trey. Next. And uh, we just uh, redid our website and we now have a database that the public can uh, choose to look at uh, our things. And so uh, if you search for it, uh, you can follow this link and then you can look at all the holdings that we continue to upload uh, on a weekly basis, new pieces, uh, not necessarily new to us, but new to the database. And uh, you can find uh, all kinds of things there to look at. So next. So the story with Nell in uh, the Historic Costume and Textile Museum began with a phone call that I had from a friend of mine, uh, and she asked me if I had ever heard about Nellie Dawn. And I was I responded with, well, who or what is a Nellie Dawn? And, uh, and she asked me if we owned any, and I was like, I don't think so, but I'd have to check and look. And then she told me about the books that her book club was reading and wondered if I had heard about her and this, that she was a Kansas born girl. who had gone on to uh, start a very successful business uh, making dresses based out of Kansas City. Uh, and did I want to know more? And I was, uh, she worked on campus, so I jumped up, ran over to her office, asked to borrow the book, and brought it back, read it. Uh, it was uh, a book that was written by her great nephew, uh, 
and I was thoroughly entranced. Uh, but she also asked me if we had a handy dandy, and I was like, what's that? <laughs> and I wasn't sure what that was. But uh, now our holdings for the in the museum, we have dresses and jackets, suits, blouses, and skirts. We now have over 275 pieces. Uh, we have 15 original black and white promotional photo photos of the Donnelly Garment Company and scans of the company's style catalogs for select years. And we've scanned over 125 uh, archival documents, letters, and advertising pieces that we use to help date the manufacturer's time period for the, our Nellie Don collection. So those are very, very useful for us. And then that handy dandy. And what is it? Well, it's going to be the single garment that was produced by the Donnelly Garment Company that provided the means to support the entire workforce of the Donnelly Garment Company before, during, and after the Great Depression. We'll learn more about that later in my presentation. Next. So these are images of now uh, as a young woman, uh, <clears throat> but who was she? Well, she was the 12th of 13 children, the fifth daughter born to first generation American Irish in 1889. She graduated from Parsons High School. She attended Parsons Business College and moved to KC and took a job as a stenographer at the age of 16. She had two sisters that I've since discovered based on the uh, United States uh, census records that were uh, registering as tailors. Now, keep in mind that her siblings were older than she was, but the significance of that is that the sisters listed themselves as tailors and not dressmakers because tailors were men women and tailors were always uh, had, well, first of all, they were paid more. They were generally men and uh, their skill set was just a little more uh, robust, I guess we'll say, and technical. But the sisters felt that that's the title they should have. Uh, after Matt, excuse me, now moved to Kansas City, she met and married Paul Donnelly in 1906 when she was 17 years old. Nell had always wanted to attend college and went as a young newlywed to Lindenwood College in St. Charles, Missouri, graduating in 1909. She was the first married woman to be a student at Lindenwood. She later in years will serve on the board of that college that she, where she first attended. Sewing was a hobby for Nell and she turned it into a business. By inverting her married name of Donnelly, she created Nellie Dom. Nell challenged conventional ideas and encouraged her employees to expand their experiences, opportunities, and education. And she was right in step with early women's rights. And this is just one of the unique characteristics of Nell. Next. These are the very first four Nellie Dawn dresses that the museum acquired in 2006. They date to the late 1940s to the 1960s. In working with Nell's great nephew, Terrence Michael O'Malley, I learned more about Nell. I first got to know Terrence during the planning of our first Nellie Dawn exhibition back in 2006. He had just launched the video, A Stitch in Time, and published the book with the same name. 
And that was the book that my friend and her book club were reading. I went to see the exhibition of their collection at the Irish Museum in Kansas City and saw that the entire collection was on loan from Terence and his wife, Heather. I asked if he would be willing to loan their collection to the Historic Costume and Textile Museum to include in our 2006 exhibition, and they did. We established a great report and have since worked together many times. And Terrence has graciously allowed us to uh, me to include about a 10 minute segment from his DVD, A Stitch in Time. Next slide. Okay, click. It should click it and then, yeah. In 1948, Dorothy McGuire was nominated for an Academy Award as Best Actress in the film Gentleman's Agreement. Two years later, before a national radio audience of 8 million listeners, McGuire portrayed Nellie Don in The Golden Needle. DuPont, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents The Cavalcade of America, starring Dorothy McGuire. I don't know anyone, man or woman, who doesn't enjoy looking at a pretty dress. Tonight, I think you'll enjoy listening to the story of a woman who's got a million of them. Nellie Donnelly. Nellie Don, who took a needle and a piece of gingham and built a great American enterprise. Thus proving, as the song says, that everything's up to date in Kansas City. <laughs> Her company became the largest in the country. In 1946, she built the largest garment factory on the face of the planet under a single roof. So, uh, what's not generally known is that she was a manufacturing genius. She had the a beautiful suite on the 57th floor of the Empire State Building, which she was one of the original tenants of the Empire State Building. <laughs> of 
Nellie Dawn, built for the American woman, built by an American woman, Nellie Dawn, with a vision of the desires of those just like herself. Twenty years ago, a housewife, Nellie Dawn, created the apron frock that was soon to be recognized throughout the country. But what has 20 years brought? Nellie Dawn creations for every occasion. Dress and style that touch the heart of not just a few friends, as in the beginning, but every woman in the land. And even so, every garment still deserves and is blessed by that added touch that makes it strictly Nellie Dawn. Like good news, the name of Nellie Don has spread from within those few small blocks in Kansas City to every town, city, and metropolitan area. Everyone, not only in the United States, but in many neighboring countries as well, may see, purchase, and appreciate the creations of Nellie Don. I didn't run across a woman in my research who, by any matter of means, equated what Nell did. Uh, she, she started it. I, Nell was the colonel uh, of, of the whole business. It was her idea. She started it and she built it. Her first dress was a, a pink gingham number that uh, combined uh, attractiveness and utility. Really what she did was to invent the house dress. She felt it was possible for women to look attractive while being in a position to work. She felt that the house dress that she wore, and, I, and you read this term all of, all of the time, and it's rarely used now, looked frumpy. And she wanted to have a, a, a more, maybe alluring appearance for her husband. I'm sure the word sexy never entered the vocabulary back in the early 1900s. But uh, possibly that is, is what it was. Oh, I wish I could look stylish like the actresses. Well, you do, Liz. Well, you certainly do today, anyway, in that darling dress. Oh, do you really like it? Mm. Uh, Nell made it for me for Christmas. Mm -hmm. Honestly? Well, she made mine, too. And you must have made your own, Nell. Mm -hmm. Why, we're a regular fashion show of your creations. <laughs> you know, Nell, instead of giving dresses away like you do, I think you ought to make them to sell. Well, that's a sell. wonderful oh, idea. Oh, why, they're only cotton house dresses. But you could make a fortune, honestly. Nell, we're serious. You can't find anything like them in the store. And the way women go around the house looking like perfect frights. Why, why, just think of the husband you'd be doing a favor to. Yes, I am thinking. Having gone to all these different, all of, of the uh, major venues in town, finally she came to a, a store named Peck's. And uh, she was at this point, uh, if not disheveled, disheartened because she'd been rejected so much, and she asked to speak to the buyer. If a woman had something that was in style and really fit her, she might be willing to pay, say, up to a dollar. A dollar? Listen, are you touched? You asked me that before. I don't believe I am. Look, Mr. Ballinger, what does your wife wear to cook and clean in? Hmm? Oh, I don't know. Every year I usually take her home a couple of Mother Hubbards, size large, Never gave it much thought. Well, how would you like to see her in something, oh, real pretty for a change? Something she could, well, say, answer the doorbell in, too. Yes, I see what you mean. No, no use trying to high-pressure me. Our customers aren't millionaires, you know. Oh, please, it wouldn't cost you anything to try and sell them. Dollar for a house dress. No, I, I couldn't take the chance. Look, I'm the one who's taking the chance. What if I made up, let's see, uh, 18 dozen? Well... Oh, thank you. Oh, you won't regret it. I know you won't. Miss, you got plenty of gumption, I'll say that for you. But gumption don't sell merchandise. And if yours don't sell, you're going to be sorry you ever saw the inside of this store. <laughs> she did take her dress or maybe a couple of dresses down to George B. Peck and walked out with an order for 18 dozen to be accomplished in two months. Now I think any woman who was not built of great intestinal fortitude would have fainted. We sat in the spare room, Katie and Mrs. Herbert and I. We stitched yard after yard of pink ruffles by day and dreamed about him at night, 
We cut and we tucked. We fitted. We stitched and we pressed. And we kept drinking coffee from a bottomless pot. But we weren't going fast enough. So, I worked out a system where each of us made a share of each dress. The second thing that she did was to put the fashion industry on the assembly line. She saw what Henry Ford had done with cars, and she thought that dresses could be made in the same way. Uh, and her feeling was, and again, you have to understand, this started in her living room. So she, obviously she knew her employees very well. They were friends to start out with in terms of the uh, first people who came to work with her. They were neighbors. And she knew that there were strengths and weaknesses to each of the individual as a seamstress. Some people were good at sewing seams. Some people were good at sewing buttons, buttonholes, you know, you know, whatever it was. So it was possible to put someone in a position where they could do their best. There's the phone, Nell. Hello? Hello? I got a riot on my hands out there. Why didn't you warn me about those dresses of yours? Well, what is it? What's happening? I run out of the entire 18 dozen already, that's what. And now I got a mob of women on my hands, sore as a boil, because I got none left. Oh! Why, my own wife's one of them. Uh, say, how soon can you deliver me some more, and how many? Well, I, I, I think I, I... Don't think. I, Just get busy. And keep them coming to me fast. You can turn yeah. them out. You know you got a gold mine here, Miss Donnelly? A gold mine? Oh, no. A golden needle. And that was the beginning of what became an empire. Okay, next slide, Trey. Okay, so how it began. So this illustration that you're seeing on your screen is a variation on that apron frock that started the company with a mere budget of startup money of $1,270 is what she used to begin the company. She was 27 years old, her husband, Paul, was president of the company. Nell was the secretary, but that will change. So Nellie Dons were known for their quality. They were durable, fashionable. Their fit was great and they were affordable. During the heyday, the garment industry was the second largest employer in Kansas City with over 4,000 people on the payroll. Only the stockyards employed more people. Employees lived typically on the Kansas side of the city. Unlike New York City, Kansas City did not have a large pool of immigrant workers to draw on. By 1929, the company had employed more than 1,000 workers and were producing 5,000 dresses per day using the section work assembly line. But Nell was most proud of the great report she had with her employees. She had grown up in a large family and she knew how best to help those pri primarily female workers. Next slide. So the blue dress uh, that you're seeing on the screen is a mother hover. And that's what Nell uh, described as frumpy. And you heard Jean refer to dressing frumpy in the video. Friends had urged Nell to sell her dresses to the public. So you can see the comparison between the two uh, and how much more stylish the pink apron frock is. And when she went cold calling for the uh, department stores in Kansas City and finally lands that order for 18 dozen dresses with George C. Peck's department store. The pink apron frock that's shown here is in the holdings of the Jackson County Historical Museum in Independence, Missouri. And they very graciously loaned the uh, this dress to the Historic Costume and Textile Museum for our 2006 Nellie Dawn exhibition. So if you go out and are looking on the internet for uh, any images of the pink apron frog, it is this image that I took. I find it quite interesting to see how far it's gone. Next slide. 
So one of the other things that the company will do in a, a few short years is they created this line of fashion dolls that you're seeing here. Uh, and the one with the uh, circle or oval around it is shown wearing the uh, fashion doll size version of the apron frock. Now, these dolls were completely uh, created by employees of the company. I don't know who the person or persons were, but they all had uh, individual wigs uh, that could be interchanged if they needed to be. They carried accessories, uh, but their bodies were all sculpted and pan painted and they stood on a wooden base with a paper tag uh, on them that said what year that they were of the dress uh, that was being featured. And so here is the dress that I'm showing you uh, from uh, 1916 that was the best-selling design. And then uh, next to that is a copy of a newspaper article that I was able to find and uh, it is, let's see, find my notes. It is from the Selma Journal, published in February 4th of 1940. So the dolls had already been out on, a, on tour for four years at this time. Uh, but it, it, I can find the mention of the dolls through various uh, newspaper articles, uh, thanks to newspapers.com. And so I can kind of track where all they've been and uh, what all they're doing, which is quite fun to follow them as well. Uh, but they uh, were able to show some of the fashions and the history of the company to uh, these various locations around the, uh, the US. And uh, the article that is included here states there were eight miniature models or dolls that toured. But we know from company publicity photos, the making of the dolls continued to be made and toured until Nell sold the company in 1956. Next slide. Okay, so here's uh, the blue dress that is pictured in the, uh, of the original dress there. And you can see it there on the, the doll. And then the uh, three-piece ensemble that is shown next to the blue dress, it's kind of a pale green print. Uh, and you can see the doll that is wearing that. And so the uh, blue dress is from 1924 and it's a beautiful linen dress. And we'll see a linen dress in just a few moments. Not this one, but a different one. And then the three-piece ensemble is from 1929. And I think that it's modeled after uh, Chanel's uh, little black dress that she comes out with uh, just in 1926. So next slide. But those are from the collection of uh, Terrence and Heather O'Malley. So... This is the linen dress I just mentioned uh, that is similar to the beautiful blue one that was there in that slide. And this apricot one is uh, has some beautiful, very slight de uh, details about it that I'm going to have to have you squint to see. Uh, but along the the back of the between the the lace trim, there is a row of two white stitched pin tuck that curve along that back. And then those are mirrored again, just below the hip line uh, of the skirt. And then it has an asymmetrical opening of crocheted and crocheted buttons. And then there's some crocheted lace that's probably machine made, but we're dating this one typically 1925. And by this time, Nell has already become a millionaire and the company is prospering. Uh, but personally, Nell and Paul's marriage is falling apart, and she will eventually buy out his shares of the Donnelly, Gar excuse me, Donnelly Garment Company stock. Next. Now, I mentioned the handy dandy, 
And what the handy dandy actually was, was a concept that Nell patented. And so I'm showing you the, uh, the actual copy of the US patent. You can go look it up yourself uh, and you can print off your own set of uh, her instructions uh, for making this. And I actually uh, just had a lady from uh, North Carolina who is making four of these for her friends and she's been sending me photos of them. So it's quite fun. Uh, I have drafted a pattern of my own based on this uh, drawing that's there. And uh, so, but what's cool about this apron is that it sold for a dollar in 1926. And today that dollar apron would cost you $17.46, which would still be a bargain. So next slide. So these are some of our uh, later uh, versions of the handy dandy. The company will make it for many, many years. And you can see that there are uh, two distinctly different styles uh, and the labels inside them are different. So they date to different time periods, uh, but the white and pink one on the, uh, I believe it would be on your left, is more of a, uh, maybe a hostess apron would be, might be what you would uh, be uh, preparing or serving if you had guests over for dinner. And then the calico one over on the right is certainly more of uh, an everyday type apron. And if you note the details, they're both found with a cotton bias tape, but they're both a little different stylistically. Obviously one is more dressy, but it has that diagonal uh, yoke in the front where the calico one has it just uh, straight across. But how can an apron save a business or a family's livelihood? Just wait. Next slide, please. So we're back to our fashion doll. And so here she is showing you uh, that the handy dandy was the best selling design from the year uh, 1925. And then the model is also wearing a, a smock that the company also made and sold, but nobody that I have come across has any of those in their uh, holdings uh, of Nellie Dawn fashions. So I'm on the lookout for that one. But you also note that the apron has a little bit different style lines. And it did vary uh, as the company uh, progressed through the years. But following the crash of the stock market in 1929, the company relied upon this apron as a means of support for the predominantly female workforce as the garment industry, like other industries, had a seasonal workforce. So let me remind you what I mean by that. And so you would hire on hopefully skilled workers, but if they weren't, you had to train them and you specifically had to train them to use the a specific machine. The videos that you saw earlier, those were images of probably the mid 40s whenever they had their new production facilities. In the 1920s, uh, when the company is really gearing up, uh, the machines would have been similar, but uh, maybe not quite as varied uh, and detail oriented. And so it would have required a much more skilled set of uh, skills and techniques. And so you would hire these people on, train them, the, they would make the dresses, the dresses would be, uh, would fulfill all the orders and be shipped out. And then what did you do with the workforce? You laid them off until you needed them for the next season. And that was typical for the industry. So because Nell had grown up in that large family and knew what it was like to have to make do, because she grew up having to repair and restyle those older sister's clothes for herself, 
she wanted to do something more. And so that's when she hit upon the idea of something that every woman wore and she wore it every day and she might be willing or be able to buy more than one. Uh, but it needed to be affordable. And so she came up with a concept for making this apron and the patent was not necessarily on the style of the apron, but on the way the apron was put together and assembled. So it never left the bed of the sewing machine. And I can tell you for a fact, and I'm a skilled seamstress myself, that trying to sew a quarter inch uh, seam tape without a the right attachment for your machine is very challenging and very difficult. And I couldn't do it in a single thing of uh, trying to keep it under the, uh, the fit of the machine. So uh, I would love to know more uh, about how that could have been done, but that has been lost to time. Uh, but the handy dandy kept the Donnelly Garment Company afloat and the company came out of the Great Depression stronger. So next slide. So this is a miniature apron that we uh, were given by a donor and was worn by one of the Donnelly Company garment fashion dolls. Uh, it has the Nelly Dawn handy dandy garment tag inside, and I've shown a picture of it here. Uh, we don't have a date for when this uh, particular apron, uh, this polka dot version of that apron was made. But uh, you may wonder why I'm talking so much about an apron, but this apron came to the rescue of so many. And the sales provided so many things for this company to keep afloat. Next slide. So the dolls on tour. And so this particular window is from the Colonial Trust Company of New York City. And it's from a, a display in the late 1940s. So next slide. So Nell had gone to a uh, business uh, college, but mainly was learning to train as a stenographer and learn uh, some business principles. But her skills that she learned whenever she went on over to Lindenwood College, I think really benefited her as being as well as those uh being a, a, from a rural town in a, a small Kansas community. And she had a real sense for business. And this was her slogan. Uh, that's also the company logo. Uh, and she used it on everything. So it was part of that early branding. But she encouraged you, wherever you saw this logo, to just try one on. So it was a catchy phrase. Uh, and it was one that encouraged women to go ahead and try it on. Because she felt that if you did put it on, you could you would notice the attention to detail, the quality of the materials, the fit, the style, and would encourage you to buy it. Next slide. This is one of our earliest Nellie Dawn dresses that the museum has uh, been able to uh, acquire. Uh, it is white organdy. So it's a very sheer fabric and you can kind of tell on the mannequin that it's on, you can kind of see right through it. And so frequently people ask me, is that how they would have worn a very thin dress like that? Well, they did wear them, but they likely had on uh, their undergarments as well as a slip. And the women wore a full slip in those days. Uh, so you wouldn't have been able to see through the dress quite as much, but it would have been because the fabric was lightweight, it would have been very comfortable to wear during hot summers. Uh, but it is a tone on tone stripe uh, and it's the bias binding is a calico print. It's pink and black and it features this dropped waist with a side sash bow and uh, it's 
by its binding. And on the inside, all of the seams are also bound with bias tape. Next slide. So this is one of those pieces that's from Terrence and Heather's O'Malley's collection. I would dearly love to have a dress like this for our museum. Uh, I think it's a very fashion forward look and I'm going to uh, pose a question here to the group and to look at some of the details, but I'll point out the fact that it's, it is a gingham and now use, goes back to gingham prints frequently throughout the uh, time that she is a design, uh, designer at the company. But also look at some of the details. It is a calico print that she's combining with that gingham which is something that we don't see much at this time. So this is a late, uh, mid to late uh, 1920s dress and it's shown on a, a period mannequin of the time period. Uh, so that would have been the hairstyle that a young woman would have worn uh, wearing this dress. So next slide. Then this one is a little later, and so it dates to uh, circa 1930. And the advertisement that I'm showing you is from a newspaper uh, of a similar style from 1932. Again, it's this sheer fabric. She didn't always make things out of sheer fabric. That would depend upon the season. Uh, but this particular excuse me, this particular one is a pale green and then it features this pale green trimming in an asymmetrical opening. And under that side opening, there is a tiny little three by three inch square of a pocket that's hidden underneath that. So you could have tucked away a, a handkerchief to carry with you. But the seams are bound uh, yeah, along all the inside. And that's gonna come into play in just a moment. Next slide. So this is showing you that you can see the detail of that particular style of dress just a little closer. This one's from the Kansas City Star, September 12th, 1932. Next slide. I always feel like it's a jackpot moment when I can find a match up address to an advertisement in the newspaper. And you talk about a eureka moment. Um, I'm dancing on top of my desk whenever I find those. So uh, this is one of those fashion dolls and we were actually able to have a, a donor assisted in acquiring uh, two dresses of that award-winning or popular style from uh, 1930 and we have it in a yellow and black, and then we have it in a red and black colorway. And so it's really exciting to be able to find this same dress in multiple colorways, because typically a manufacturer like the Donnelly Garment Company would have offered that dress, same style of dress in either multiple colorways or uh, very similar fabrics. Okay, next slide. So this is a picture of some of those seam allowances on the inside. So the one which is the pink plaid, uh, those are from the earlier time period of the company and they would bind off all of the seams uh, within the inside of the dress so that it was very sturdily made, which is great. It makes it very durable. It's gonna hold together well. But what it doesn't allow you to do is make any alterations to that dress. If you need to let a seam out, there is nowhere to go with that. And so uh, that's sort of a disadvantage and it made it maybe perhaps a little harder to fit. The yellow and black dress, it has a little lightweight, lighter weight version of that. You can see it's more of a net. It's actually kind of a, a knitted fabric uh, woven uh, that they were using to bind the seams with. Uh, and I use 
a combination of things. Whenever I'm dating a, a dress, I look at the certainly the style uh, features within the dress and the fabrics itself, uh, the colorways, but I'm looking at some of the inside features of the dress, how it is finished up on the inside, and I'm comparing the hanged, the garment tags to some of those that we have in our collection now, and I, we have enough of them that I can pretty consistently know uh, and be able to date those styles to time periods, which is a, a godsend for museum curators. Next slide. And so here's a sample of some of those. And so you can see how they progress from that upper left uh, down through time. And then there's one over here that's Hal Harden. And he is one of the uh, men that was featured in the video. He was an older uh, gentleman that sat in the chair and talked about Nell uh, being a tenant on the uh, 31st floor of the Empire State Building. He and some of his uh, fellow employees there at the company, whenever Nell decided to sell the company, they bought it uh, from her and continued to run it until about 1976. And then the company filed for bankruptcy, but Hal Harden continued in the uh, manufacturing business and this is his own label. And so that's why I've included it here. So next slide. Uh, I was contacted after that 2006 exhibition by Hildred Watson, and she had worked at the Donnelly Garment Company, and she had worked there during uh, the 1930s in their marketing department. And so she had some of those original black and white glossy photos that she was, wanted to donate to a museum. And she was so excited to find that somebody was putting together a collection of garments from the Donnelly Garment Company. So we have her marketing uh, things that she worked on. And so I featured one of those images here. So originally I didn't have a date for this photograph. So next slide. And then I found the dress in a newspaper ad. And so there's the Eureka moment. Uh, so then I knew that uh, that particular ad campaign or dress style had been done in the 1931 time period. So thanks Hildred for saving these for posterity. Next slide. So uh, this particular dress uh, is also a pink linen, a uh, pale pink, but uh, the top portion that's kind of a, a lighter color, uh, that's actually cotton eyelet. And you can see in the detail photo that it's pretty sheer and open. But again, you a woman would have worn it with her uh, full slip on underneath. Uh, but it uh, features this bow detail. Now, uh, Nell frequently would travel to Paris uh, every season to uh, go to the various uh, shows to see what the uh, coming fads and trends and styles were going to be. Uh, and then she would bring home those ideas and incorporate it into the company's designs. Now, she did have a team of designers that worked for her, but she was always over oversaw the design. And I believe that this at this time period that this bow detail is an idea that originated from uh, Schiaparelli. Uh, then about the same time period as this dress, this dress appeared in ads in April of 1931. But on December of 1931, Donnelly and her chauffeur, George Blair, were returning uh, Nell home on Oak Street at about 6 p.m. when they were stopped and an armed man got into the car beside Blair, tied him up, blindfolded him, and took over driving the car. 
Two other men had entered the car and sat on either side of Donnelly. Come to find out, they were going to uh, hold them for ransom uh, for uh, $75,000. At this time, Nell's friend, and uh, they had become acquainted because they lived across the alley from each other and both had dogs that they would be out walking. But her friend, James A. Reed, stepped in and sent the kidnappers a message. Now, James A. Reed is the fighting senator, was known as the fighting senator from Missouri, and he's also going to be running for uh, vice or, uh, president at the vice president at the time. And he steps in and tells uh, reporters, if a single hair on her head is harmed, I will spend the rest of our lives running the culprits to earth and securing for them the extreme penalty of the law, which in Missouri is death by hanging. He called the most powerful crime boss in Kansas City, Johnny Lazia, and ordered him to have Donnelly released. Now, Lazia didn't kidnap Donnelly, but he went to Lazia to have him help track down the people that did, which they did. Uh, and Nell was returned unharmed, but they had uh, been kept in captivity for 34 hours. So it was a really uh, harrowing uh, event in her life. Next slide. This is a particular image from Hildred uh, from Taylor's department store promotion for Nellie Dawn Week. Uh, and it's from September of 1932. So you can kind of see uh, that the style lines are a little longer than what they were in the 20s. Uh, and this is likely going into the fall season. So you can see that the fabric weight and the sleeves are long sleeve, but the fabric weight is looks heavier than that sheer cotton voile. Next slide. So this is one of the uh, pages that we were able to, able to scan from Terrence and Heather O'Malley's collection uh, that shows different styles and the fabrics that were uh, used to make those styles. And so these are extremely uh, useful for us in knowing the style, the time period, the fabrics, the name of the fabric, uh, and uh, then they're just fun renderings. Next slide. So uh, as we were watching that video, I there were some scenes where there were more of a playwear type look to some of the Donnelly garment clothing, but the, it happens in those late 30s going into the 40s time period. And this is a pair of Nellie Dawn uh, pajamas or a jumpsuit or beach pajamas. Uh, they're a cabana striped green and white cotton twill. It is a halter style jumpsuit. And so to get into the back, it hooks on each side of the waist and uh, there's no real zipper to it. It's all hooks and eyes. So I think you would have had to rely on good friends to help you get in and out of this, especially at the beach but they're uh, a full-legged pant. I tell you, whoever sees these, they're, uh, especially, you know, I'm in this college environment, uh, the young co-eds, they just think these are awesome. Next slide. Uh, this is another uh, piece that's rather unusual for not what you typically think of Nellie Dawn dresses. Uh, this is actually a pair of like Palazzo pants. I actually have wondered if this was made for Nell herself uh, because frequently she would have company parties and particularly Christmas parties for the employees and they would bring their family to the Christmas party. She'd ask the employee to give her the names of all of the children in their family. And she, and a, the, an item that she would 
uh, purchase for them, whether it be a doll or a bicycle or whatever the child wanted, the company would buy it for the child and give it to them at the party. So I've suspected that this was something that she had them make for perhaps one of those parties. I haven't documented it yet, but this is my speculation, pure speculation. But this, uh, if you can look closely at some of the details, you can see a row of buttons that goes from the shoulder to the hem that completely unbuttons all the way down. And so you step into one leg and then you start buttoning yourself into the uh, pantsuit. So it would have been quite an, uh, an a feat to get in and out of it but it's a beautiful garment. Next slide. Oh, Trey, am I running too long? Nope, you're good. I'm good? Okay. Uh, this particular, this is another one of those little lightweight summer dresses that we have in our holdings and uh, just a, a, a fun little uh, more youthful look. And she did start producing lines for uh, high school to college age girls. And this very well could have been of one of those. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is one of the sketches from their advertising campaigns and to allow you to see the different styles that were going to be coming. And this was published in September of 1932. Next slide. So in the, uh, this is actually a piece that uh, I bought uh, for the museum's holdings way back in 2008. And uh, at the time, I wasn't exactly uh, sure time period uh, to put it in. And then I found the dress and the fabric and the style books whenever we were, I was going through them one day. And uh, so it's from the summer of 1940 catalog. And so that was really one of those Eureka moments. Uh, next slide. Oh, I should back up and say that Nell and James Avery did get married. It was uh, in the mid thirties, whenever they did get married. Uh, and uh, she des describes him as the love of her life. So we are looking at fashions here from the 40s, this is from the style book of that spring 1940s look, uh, but you can begin to see World War II influences in style fiction, excuse me, style restrictions that are going to be put into effect. So the hemlines went back up from the 30s and they're going to sort of narrow in uh, during that work time production. Next slide. This is one of the Nellie Dawn Platonics uh, with a copy of the ad there uh, next to it. And this is something that uh, the company started producing for uh, perhaps that younger crowd, but uh, it wasn't necessarily socially acceptable for women to wear shorts in public. And so if you needed to have a skirt, uh, you could, uh, there was one available and this was a, just a, a little wrap skirt that can go over that. And so you would be appropriately dressed. So next slide. And then this truly is during uh, World War II. And this is the Nellie Dawn gives you a, a d workwear designed to uh, help women in the who have, were going into the workforce and helping to step into some of those positions that uh, men who had left to go to be part of the service. And so they were showing fashionable and service work clothes for women in the workforce. The clothing advertisements promoted the features with specially cut sleeves, non-binding shoulders, accessible pockets and generously cut to eliminate strain from action. <laughs> and 
And uh, at this time, she opened a second plant in St. Joseph, Missouri, dedicated to manufacturing wartime apparel. And these are rare garments. So if you ever come across one of these, uh, let me know because we're looking for them. Next slide. So I am actually showing you a pair of men's boxer shorts. But these are unique because these are made by the Donnelly Garment Company. So this is part of the company's wartime efforts. And uh, what's really great about this, in the company's files that I was able to scan, uh, they shared a story from soldiers uh, who appreciated the boxers made by the Donnelly Garment Company because of the securely sewn button. They made over 5,000 pairs of boxer shorts. The company earned two E for Excellence awards from the U.S. government in recognition for their efforts. The company uh, charged the government only what it cost to make the items, as Nell did not want the company to profit from wartime production. So, next. So this is one of those styles from uh, spring of 1944 when, uh, so we're at the height of the U.S. participation in the World War II and the War Production Board is imposing strict restrictions on dress. And so the dresses become much more narrowed. The gov if ladies, if you can imagine, the government actually told manufacturers how much uh, sweep, so how full a dress could be uh, based on your size, if you can imagine. And even pattern manufacturers uh, for women who were sewing at home, they were encouraged to abide by these same rules. Now, of course, seamstresses could do whatever they wanted to, but uh, it was seen as a uh, politically important to uh, abide by these war production rules and not to stray too far away. Next slide. So a few years later, this dress is the best-selling design from 1949. Uh, and it is also a little gingham number, but it's a little micro mini dot check. And uh, so it's more, I would describe as a peasant style dress. And there's its fashion doll. So next slide. And then I put it on exhibit one time. And this quilt uh, is unique. It's made from Kansas City Garment District scraps that were sold by the pound. So next slide. So this is a... a better image it was uh, with the quilt lying flat, not in an exhibit case, but I've tried to circle the blocks that are identified as being uh, perhaps from the same uh, garment manufacturer. We actually had a quilt historian come and she was documenting these quilts and those particular quilt blocks that are marked are the same uh, motif, but in different colorways. Next slide. And there's the book. So if you're interested in knowing more about uh, Kansas City Garment District uh, quilt inspiration, you can look for this book. Next. So this was one of those early dresses that I had bought and showed you that uh, the Fringe of the Costume and Textile Museum purchased back in 2006. Uh, but we were excited because it was a gingham number, uh, a little shirtwaist style. But the tiered skirt, those are actually cut on the bias, those, those tiers. And so it, it has a nice effect. And I would say that that's one of the things that the Donnelly Garment Company is known for, is maximizing the use of the fabric in interesting ways. Excuse me, next slide. This one uh, is a two-piece ensemble with the belt and the white collar is actually detachable and, and you can button it off or wear it with it. 
<coughs> Excuse me, next slide. <coughs> this one is a black eyelet lace dress with a, a, a lace overlay of, on a bouffant style dress. So uh, kind of inspired by that, uh, maybe some styles or today's styles uh, where Kate Middleton's wedding dress was a similar style as this. But this is one of the originals. This one's from 1950. And the skirt actually features four box pleats, but it, you can see that it has more of a full sweep. And it has black, eye, or excuse me, black velvet buttons down the front. Next slide. And then this is another one that the college students all swoon over. Uh, it's a sundress and it has this faux uh, button, or excuse me, faux tie look where it looks like the shoulder straps come through and tie on the front of the dress. It actually doesn't, it's all just made to look that way, but it's just such a cute style that the girls all think this is really cute and it is pretty cute. Next slide. And then when I talked about making great use of the fabric and style details, this is an example of that. Uh, a knee-length Nelly Dawn dress, it has no sleeves, uh, but this stripe of uh, that's such a bold design where it cuts through the bodice and then the skirt would be such, if you're a pattern maker, you can look at this and go, I could do that. <laughs> so it's pretty fun. And next slide. And then uh, I'm going to point out the dress in the middle. Uh, this is a pink version. Next slide. And we have the same dress in black, new with tag even. So uh, that's pretty exciting to be able to find them like that. So I believe that dates to the early 60s. Next slide. Why? Because of the hat. Then this dress featured in that same advertisement, you could actually, it's currently listed on Etsy, which I find fascinating in a different colorway. Next slide. And then as I was putting together this Humanities Kansas presentation, I found we had a copy of this ad and I was looking at this black and white dress over here and I found this one, next slide, which was very similar. And I was very excited to be able to have found this dress. And it's a darling little cotton foil summer dress. And next slide. And then I found the dress pictured in the ad. Uh, so of course we had to acquire that one. Oh, and then a picture of its tag. Next slide. And then this is one of our newest acquisitions. And we actually have one of the four known, <coughs> excuse me, Nellie Dawn dolls. She's a 1953 fashion doll. I've been talking too much. Next slide. <clears throat> Another recent example of acquisition. Next slide. I want to get to question. This one's really reminds me very much of that black jumpsuit because it's a satin type fabric. But um, we purchased this for the museum and we have yet to find any mention of it in advertisements. So, but it does have the Donnelly Garment Company uh, label in it. And I believe it takes to the same period as that black jumpsuit. Next slide. Oh, showing you some of the details. It's a sort of this wrap. So they were really experimenting. Uh, they did start producing more, like you saw in some of the slides, more of this cocktail look. Uh, and going beyond just the day dresses. Next. 
And then this is one of our most recent and was featured in tonight's advertisement. Uh, and it's, you can see the detail in this dress with just merely using it on grain and then do, using parts of it in the bias and for both the bodice and the skirt. So the bottom portion of the skirt is on grain. So the plaid is running straight, but then that just below the waistline uh, it gives them, a, it actually makes uh, your waistline smaller because it's got all these diagonal lines. So just style tip there, ladies. Next. And then we have this cute little sundress and much like the pretty pink floral one, this one has uh, spaghetti straps that go over it. And so it's a recent acquisition. And then next slide. This is some uh, still photos of the Terrence's latest uh, enterprise, and he actually produced the Nelly Don movie uh, and musical, Nelly Don musical. And so if you're in the Kansas City area, you can uh, perhaps go and see this at the Glenwood Arts Theater. Um, I'm not sure if it's still running, but it, it did. It was running, I think, on Wednesday. So uh, next. Questions? Marla, that was incredible. Um, oh, I, will, I will say that this is generally not my area of interest or expertise, but I was enthralled throughout this entire Oh, thank you. And I have to say, great PowerPoint. Your image selections, it, it was fantastic. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I apologize for my stuttering. I will, will say it is now 2.47 my time. <laughs> so I did take a nap today. Anyway, are there any questions? Yeah. Um, so uh, we have one from Hannah here. Uh, did any women who worked under Nellie Don go on to have their own fashion design career? I don't know that there are. I do know that the some of the men did uh, keep it going. And then Hal struck off as in his own, but I don't know that there were any women. Okay. But I tell you, the women that ha I have come across several older women uh, and been able to talk and speak with them about their time with Nellie Dawn. And they they just rave. I mean, everyone just raves about this woman. I so wish I could have known her, uh, but I only get to know her through these other stories and ways. Right. Um, so we have a, a few people asking about the the miniature figures and the, the dolls. Um, yes. Uh, do you, one of the questions asked if you have any in your collection in it, from that last uh, slide, it looks like you have one. We have one. There, we know of four. Uh, the family have two, uh, and then the Kansas City uh, Museum has one. I so, believe. So, was it just like one collection of these dolls that traveled around, or were there? It was. They would actually box them and crate them up and ship them around. I'm not exactly sure how they traveled by truck or rail. But uh, having had my own traveling exhibit, I can only imagine the wear and tear that might have occurred on them and the freshening up that might have had to taken place. Uh, but uh, yeah, they traveled around for a good 20 years. And so, you know, they had to keep making additional clothes and wigs and things for them. I mean, they had purses and gloves, for goodness sakes. You know, yeah, well, they're yeah, they're they're so detailed. Uh, they it, are. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, well, and I what, don't think they have any at the the doll museum in Kansas City. I've I I've yet to find out if they have any, but uh, it's, I should follow that route. Well, when when they they first came up, I I turned to my my colleague Joy and I was like, Joy, when were Barbies created? Because. <laughs> I mean, these that these was in the fifties. Incredible. So, um, I believe that's that's awesome. Um, uh, Darren here is asking 
Uh, how was she able to keep the prices of the dresses so low with not very many immigrant workers in KC? Uh, just the, the Ford process? I would say it was the Ford process. And she was really shrewd, uh, you know, uh, and she did a lot of sourcing. Uh, she would was a largest large enough manufacturer that she would actually, they would print her own designs. And so that was all done in house, which I'm sure saved some. Uh, she, uh, I would say she had a love of what we call in the business finding. So the buttons and trim pieces that she used uh, were always very high quality, but she, she was, had such a knack for making use of the and taking advantage of the fabric, you know, cutting it on different directions or using a border print in an interesting way uh, that, or the way she combined fabrics, uh, you know, not that it was completely unique. She just was really good at making use of that. And so I would imagine after having worked with that Nellie Don patent idea and that apron, you end up with the scraps that you could hold in your hand like this. There's no waste. Uh, so I don't <laughs> think there were a lot of scraps. That is just incredible. Uh, yeah. Uh, another question here. Uh, how did you acquire so many Nelly Don pieces? Um, well, we have uh, one benefactor who's uh, kind of taken it on as his hobby uh, to help us find some of these hard to reach ones. And, you know, he, uh, he gives them to us and as a tribute to his wife, who was a fashion icon herself. And uh, so uh, Richard Reese is uh, that man and he's very generous and has purchased many uh, as Randy Bray, who we, you may have seen his name mentioned several times in this slide. He's a friend of Terrence's. Uh, and then we have pieces that Terrence and Heather have given us. My, myself, uh, I'm always out scouting on eBay and Etsy for them, as well as at you know, any of the antique stores that I go to. Uh, so I'm always on the lookout, uh, but, we try to focus our collection on when Nell had the company. You know, I only have a few selected pieces that go beyond that line in the sand, but because, you know, collection space is always at a premium. Yes. You have to be very strict, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> yes, well, yeah. Um, th this is a, a really tough question, but do you have a favorite piece? Oh, I think I like that black satin piece. It's the mystery involved in it that's got me, you know, intrigued. And so I am actually, I keep my my own subscription to newspapers.com, not to plug them. Uh, but, and I, I have search terms that I have out there. And so fortunately you can have it send you things along the way, but I am going almost individually by day through the years from 1930 to 1945 to try to see if I can find any advertisements for that. Uh, and I haven't turned it up yet. I'm through 36. <laughs> so I've got a little ways to go. <laughs> But, uh, and I only get to do that on when I, you know, some downtime at the museum. Right. Well, we'll all keep our fingers crossed for you. Thanks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll make an announcement. <laughs> well, we, I think probably all here are wondering, uh, are you planning uh, another Nellie Don exhibit anytime in the future? Well, am I planning another exhibit? Not yet. Uh Unfortunately, for my museum, I don't have a large ex display exhibit space. So I'm always relying on the generosity of other museums to allow me to come in and to show it. But I do have a museum that is interested in the story, in Nellie Don's story. And so I'm working with them to try to make that happen. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll have to stay tuned for that. Um, yeah, it could be the Kansas Museum of History. <laughs>
<laughs> well, you heard it here, folks. Uh, heard it here first. <laughs> well, Marla, this has been awesome. It's been so much Thank fun. You. I learned so much. Um, and I, I, everybody here, go to K State. Go visit Marla. Um, see, see some. Make of the, an appointment. Make an appointment first. Yes. <laughs> I'm well, not always there. <laughs> yeah. So do yeah. Do your due diligence and uh, contact her. Um, well, thank you so much for staying up late. Uh, yeah. I'm sure that you want to get to bed. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, but you went above and beyond for us today. Um, oh, so happy to help. Are even more thankful than we usually would be. Um, so I hope everybody here can tune in next month, uh, March 13th, 6.30 p.m., to hear Eric P. Anderson present Diversity and Complexity in Indian Kansas. So from all of us here at Museum After Hours, thank you so much, so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.